So if someone is going to be making that decision about what language they're going to be using next, a fair question is, what makes this language different from the other languages that are out there? And that's what I'm going to be talking to, uh, to you about today. What makes Haskell unique? Since we're at a functional programming conference, it seems like the appropriate place to start is with, sorry. Is this doing, hold on. I seem to be skipping over the wrong number of slides. Just give me one second. It's doing that again. Hmm. This is unfortunate. Uh, okay. You can read the markdown. Should I just should I just should I just switch you over to the markdown? Yeah. <laughs> you guys want that? This is a great way to get started. Okay, last shot. Okay, we're good now. Okay, so the question is. Is Haskell a functional programming language? And most people here would probably say, yeah, Haskell is a functional programming language. But how did we get there? How do you know that something is a functional programming language? You need some kind of a definition. So let's come up with a definition. A definition could be that you've got first class functions and you've got higher order functions. And unfortunately, if you use a definition like that, you end up saying that C is also a functional programming language, which is probably not what you intended. OK, fine, so we could come up with a different thing. We could say that you need closures, you need something else. Whichever way you cut it, you're going to end up saying that there are a lot of functional programming languages out there. So saying Haskell is functional and therefore it's different isn't enough. There are quite a few things we could say about Haskell. We could say any one of these. And I don't think anyone is really going to disagree about the claims that I'm making here. Now, some of these claims are uh, relatively unique to Haskell. They're not things that... Uh, most other programming languages have. Uh, some of them are not. So pure languages, lazy languages, uh, there aren't really too many of those that are mainstream today. Uh, but there are quite a few languages out there that are natively uh, compiled, that provide native executables or garbage collection. What I'm going to claim is that it's not about any one of these individual features making Haskell unique. Instead, the combination, the intersection, of a large number of these features is what makes Haskell unique. Instead of being able to say functional programming in Haskell allows you to do something, the combination of functional style and purity and strong typing produces a kind of program which is different than the way you would write it in other languages. I'm going to give you some concrete, many concrete examples of this, in fact. And what I'm going to claim is not only is this different, but in many ways, this is better. I'm also going to try to balance that out a little bit. I am a Haskell fanboy, so it's hard to balance. But I am going to try to point out some of the places where these intersections may not be great. Uh, but overall, I'm going to be biased in favor of Haskell, and you guys should have expected that coming into this. So I'm going to start off by talking about this example. Uh, so this is a little pseudocode language that I've made up for this talk. Uh, inspired by many other languages, so no one should feel like I'm picking on their pet language. And the question is, what's wrong with this bit of code? Now, you can look at the title of the slide, and you can probably guess this is a blocking call. So you're tying up an entire system thread in order to make these HTTP requests. That's a bad use of resources. That's going to be inefficient. It's going to slow your program down. You're not going to be able to handle as many concurrent threads, for example, as you may want to. So this thing will successfully make the two HTTP requests, but not do it particularly well. A standard way to work around that is callbacks. So instead of making a blocking call, we're going to make an async call. And we're going to say, when you complete that first HTTP request, then take that JSON body and pass it to a callback. And then do the same thing again, and now you're able to use this function, use JSON bodies, and you have both of these uh, things available. This is callback style. It's also known as callback hell. Some people really dislike this. We're not going to get into whether callbacks are a good thing or a bad thing, but you do definitely need to restructure your programs to be able to take advantage of this callback style. 
There are other techniques available to work around callbacks. Promises and futures are, uh, are another approach that a lot of things use. You may think, oh, well, you know, promises form a monad, and he's a Haskell guy, so he loves talking about monads, but I'm not going to say the M word. Uh, we're not going to talk about monads today. Instead, I'm going to show you how you would write an asynchronous version of this program in Haskell. Now, if you look at that example, that looks pretty similar to what I had before. If you ignore the syntax differences, it's identical. This looks like a blocking call, but it's not. And the reason is because of the way that the Haskell runtime system works under the surface. The Haskell runtime system converts what appears to be blocking calls into asynchronous calls that are going to not block an entire system thread. There's a scheduler. The Haskell scheduler will go ahead and put your thread to sleep until the data is available. It will wake it up automatically when the data is once again available. And this allows you to write in a blocking style, but get the performance advantages that you'd want of async code. Now, once again, this isn't something that only Haskell has. Early and Go are two nice examples of other languages that do this kind of technique. So therefore, if I want to tell you what makes Haskell different, we're going to need to go a little bit deeper. There's another problem with that piece of code that I showed you. We were not only, so previously we were worried about blocking. I'm going to talk about something related, but quite different. We were doing sequential calls. There, we would only begin the second HTTP request once the first HTTP request completed. And that's not necessarily what we want to do. These two things have nothing to do with each other. It would be nice to be able to start both requests at the same time allow the network latency of both of the requests to run out at the same time, we may be able to complete the requests in roughly the same amount of time if we kick them off uh, and therefore have our runtime. So that would be nice. If you start thinking about how you would implement this, you're probably thinking about some kind of an API call where you fork some threads, and you're going to have some kind of immutable locking variable where you're going to be able to put the results, and a whole bunch of other fun things that sound very not Haskell-y. But this is the way that I would recommend doing it in Haskell. We're going to use this really nice function called concurrently, which comes from the async library. And you tell concurrently the two things you want to run, and it takes care of all of the, the business logic that, you, that I just described behind the scenes for you. Now, you could say that's just a really nice library, but it's really built on top of two things that I've just described. One is this green thread implementation in Haskell, and the other is the runtime system using async I.O. Because of the way that those two things play together, that intersection of those two points, we're able to very easily get these concurrency and async I.O. benefits. Now let's change the game just a little bit more. Up until now, I've said that you need both of those JSON bodies to continue the, ex the execution of your program. Let's instead say I only care about one of them. Whichever JSON body comes back first, let's say that it's uh, two cached resources from two different servers, whichever one comes back first, that's the one I want to use, and I want to cancel the other one so that it doesn't continue doing any kind of work. This might be, and this is complicated, uh, this might be the way that you would do this in practice in most languages. You would spin off two different futures or promises. You would create some kind of a mutex for holding on to the result value. You would use and then, or something along those lines, to say what you do next once it completes. And then you would, from each one of these handlers, you would cancel the other promise so that it stops running and it won't do any further I.O. Who here, just by show of hands, would enjoy writing this code on a regular basis? Anyone? No one's idea of a good day, I'm, I'm imagining. OK, so you can probably guess what I'm about to do next. Let's see how you do it in Haskell. Haskell's got this built-in, well, not built-in, uh, in a library function called race. And all of the logic I just described previously is handled by race. And now you're probably thinking, oh, fine, so you have nice libraries. What does this have to do with Haskell the language? But the thing is, race is taking advantage of something which is relatively rare in programming languages today. It's taking advantage of asynchronous exceptions. Async exceptions allow you to kill any running exception from the outside. There are other languages that have it. I'm not saying Haskell's the only one, but it's built into the language in such a way that this is common usage of being able to do things. Uh, the other thing, though, is this isn't just about I.O. 
you may be used to the idea that you're able to kill an I.O. action. You're able to stop an I.O. action from continuing. Or that you're able to fork off a process and let this thing run in another thread. Or you're able to put something to sleep until some I.O. completes. Haskell takes it to the next level because all of the thread scheduling that I've described applies at the CPU level as well. And therefore, if you have a CPU intensive process uh, and you want to put it into its own uh, thread, you don't have to worry about that thread starving out all of the other threads. This is a common problem when writing highly concurrent servers. Uh, the behavior of this, if this went wrong, would be lack of responsiveness. And many uh, web applications today use some kind of a microservices architecture to work around this. They push off the CPU intensive parts to another machine so they don't have to deal with it. In Haskell, that's not something you would even consider doing. You would simply do a normal fork of a thread. You would let it do its business in the background. You would trust the scheduler to make sure that your application remains responsive and everything will work fine. And as an example, we have a timeout function, which is used quite a bit in, in the Haskell ecosystem. And you're able to take an expensive computation and ensure, in this case, that it runs in under 10, se or 10 seconds and then gets killed, if it's still running. So in summary, looking at all of these things, I would say that the advantages are that Haskell's got a very cheap green thread implementation. It's got a simple API to be able to do very complex things right out of the box. And using these techniques, you're easily able to write highly responsive servers. There are disadvantages, of course. That one of the disadvantages is that the, the runtime system itself is a complicated beast. That means that when you're writing your code, you are sitting on top of a relatively, lar relatively large runtime system. This affects binary size as an example, so embedded may be a little bit of a problem. Uh, the other downside, and this is something that people are a little concerned around, is async exceptions. You have to make sure that your code is written in such a way that they will respond properly and die if an async exception pops up. Fortunately, there are libraries. There's a safe exceptions library that, uh, that our team has written that uh, helps you do these things correctly. So uh, today, I don't actually consider it that big of a deal, but it is something you have to be aware of that you wouldn't have to worry about in other languages. OK. So next intersection of two different features is going to be immutability and purity. Most languages out there today have mutable values. When you have a variable, you're able to modify the value in that variable. Haskell is different from this in two ways. The first is that by default, every value is immutable. You, once you create it, it cannot be changed. If you want to have a mutable variable in Haskell, you have to explicitly mark it as mutable, and you have to mark the type of mutability that you're going to be doing on it, which I'll demonstrate later what the different kinds of mutability are. The other difference is that, mut that mutating a variable is considered an effect, a side effect sometimes called, if you're familiar, if you've heard of IO or ST, that's the kind of effect that I'm talking about here. And effects are tracked by the runtime system. So in order to properly mute, mutate a variable, or mutate it at all in Haskell, this is something which is going to show up in the, in the types. This first bit of code at the top is not real Haskell code. You'll notice that the first line says, let mute total, which I'm borrowing a little bit of uh, Rust syntax there. We don't have that in Haskell, because you can't simply say that something is mutable. You have to say how it's mutable. And you can't do it in, let, in a let binding. A let binding has to be pure. It has to be reproducible. That's not the case with mutable variables. That's going to create a block of memory that's going to be used. You have to do that as an effect in Haskell. Uh, the, uh, line, the then total is implicitly reading the value out of some mutable variable. That's also an effect. And that's not being tracked there. And you can't do total plus equals 1. Once again, that's an effect. Instead we have the code at the bottom, which looks much more convoluted and inconvenient. I don't think anyone would really say that this is fun, writing this kind of code. Uh, but it works. So in order to put up with this kind of crap, which is what I'm telling you to do, there has to be some kind of a benefit that you're getting out of it, which is not obvious from looking at the code. And let's see if I can demonstrate that there is such a thing. Now, the first thing that I'm going to point out is this isn't actually the way that anyone would write this, uh, this kind of a loop in Haskell. Instead, we would rather stick with immutable variables. And in this case, we're going to have a recursive function 
And this is you know standard functional kind of paradigm. We're going to have a, fun a recursive function. It's going to take parameters. We're going to update those parameters each time we go through the loop. And that's how we're going to mutate. We're not actually going to mutate at all. We're going to create new values. And that's standard functional approach. But the question is, why does any of this matter? I've shown you that you can do it this way. I haven't shown you why you would want to do it this way. There's a phrase that pops up a lot in the Haskell world, reasoning about code. And it might be a phrase that gets overused a lot, but I want to give you a concrete example that I think makes sense. So let's say that you've got this text file called scores.txt. And it's got some names and it's got some test scores to go along with it. And you want to read this out of a file. You want to print the lowest score and the highest score. And then you want to print the name of the first person in the file. And this kind of makes sense. This is a, you know, as far as mutable, you know, mutating imperative programs go, this makes sense. And there's something going on inside print score range. If you look at that, you could probably guess what the output of this program is going to be, I would imagine. And if, you know, take a moment and then I'll show you what I would have guessed, which is 22 is the lowest score, 55 is the highest, and Alice was the first name in the file. All of this makes sense. Nothing surprising about this. But I didn't show you what print score range does. Now, let's consider this implementation. The easiest way to get the, f the lowest and the highest value from that list is to sort it. So that's what I've done here. I've taken my vector, I've sorted it in place, and then I'm able to print out the lowest and the highest. Who wants to guess what the actual output of this program would be now that you've seen this implementation? First result is Charlie now, because Charlie had the lowest test score. This is an example of a non-local change affecting your code. There's no way to know what's going to happen in your main program unless you look at the rest of the program, because any of the variables from main that have been passed around can now be mutated. And this is what we talk about when we say reasoning about code. We would like to be able to look at one little part of the program and understand what it's doing. And in a mutating world, you can't necessarily do that. Now let's do it in Haskell. In Haskell, we're going to have some similar kinds of imperative things going on here. We're going to read out of a file, we're going to print messages, we're going to do all the imperative stuff that people think you can't do in functional programming, but we know we can do that. The thing that's different in this program is instead of passing around a mutable vector, we're passing around an immutable list. Print score range is taking a list of test results, but if you notice, when it sorts, it says let results prime. It's setting up a new value inside that function. There's no way that print score range is going to modify the value that exists in the original main function. And therefore, when I'm reading main, I don't have to worry that print score range is going to do something to screw up the variables that I've been dealing with. I'm able to look at this function one bit at a time and understand what's this program and function by function break it down and understand what it's going to do. So this reasoning about code becomes much simpler once you introduce immutability. Now let's say that I want to parallelize this program. I want to do these two things in, uh, in two different threads, which by the way, for the record, would be stupid here because printing out to the console from two threads is just an ugly, terrible mess. But let's pretend that I, I wanted to do it anyway. I'm going to go ahead and read the results from the file, and then I'm going to use concurrently once again, and I'm going to call these two functions. And we should be passing in results to both of the functions, but it wouldn't fit on the slide, so pretend like I did. We have now two threads accessing the same piece of data. In a normal programming language, this is something that should terrify you. You don't know if one, pro if one of the threads is going to concurrently modify it, you don't know if another thread is going to invalidate the data or invalidate the assumptions that I'm in the middle of making. But when you have immutability, none of these are concerns. You know that concurrent data reads are safe and concurrent data writes or any data writes are impossible. It can't be done. I know that there are cases where you would want to, mut uh, to mutate from two different threads. We'll get back to that in a later example. <clears throat> there are cases where you would want mutability. One of the prime examples would be performance. Let's say that you want to sort a vector. You can imagine if I'm doing an insertion sort, I'm going to do a lot of swapping of variables. If every time I did a swap, I had to copy an entire immutable vector 
to a new location, that would be a very slow implementation. So how do we do that in Haskell? Obviously, we have to be able to do these things in a, performance, in a performant way. What's the solution? And the answer is we have two different ways of doing it in Haskell. One is we do support just having straight out mutable variables. You can have a mutable vector and pass a mutable vector all the way around your program. Of course, you lose all the benefits I was just touting to you, but it can be done. And I'll claim that even, in, even when you do that, you're still getting an, an advantage from Haskell because now you know at least which of your data you have to be careful about when moving through your program. So you get a benefit, it's just not a great benefit. The other approach, and this is the one that people use quite a bit, is temporary mutable copies. And the idea is that you're going to take your immutable data, you're going to copy it to a mutable uh, section, you're going to perform your normal mutable algorithm there, and then you're going to freeze it back into an immutable copy. I got an example to show that. If we have sort mutable, which would look just the way that you would implement it in C or C++ or something else, except with a little bit more overhead, because Haskell makes you have a little bit more overhead, you can then use it from this sort immutable function. We have this thing called ST, which is called the strict state transformer, which doesn't really matter, but we have the ST, and this thing allows you to capture a little tiny environment where modifications are going on. This thing can't be infected from the outside world. It can't read files, it can't look at the time, it can't do network access, none of that. All it can do is deal with its own little mutable variables. And its mutable variables can't leak outside. This is all enforced by the type system with some funny techniques we're not going to get into. Inside this little block, I can do as many mutations to the data as I want. They will be efficient, they're not going to uh, deal with any kind of uh, immutable copies. And then you can see at the very end, I'm just going to freeze that mutable vector down into something immutable. I get all of the benefits that I would want out of functional programming. I know that for the same input, I'm going to get the same output. I know that nothing else is going to be mutating data that I have. The only overhead that I incur is that I'm going to have one extra uh, buffer copy to make that initial, uh, that initial temporary copy. So immutable, immutability and purity give us these advantages of being able to reason about our code, avoid data races, which makes concurrent programming much simpler, and we're able to treat functions as proper mathematical functions in the sense that the same input gives you the same output. Disadvantages are if you have something which is going to be a mutating program, you're inherently doing a lot of mutation, you're probably going to find it more verbose in Haskell than in another language simply because we make you do more work in order to make that happen. It's not the standard case. Uh, and in some of these mutable algorithms, if you're going to be doing that extra copying, there is a tiny uh, performance overhead as opposed to using the mutable versions throughout. All right, so now concurrent mutation. So I've basically been trying to tell you guys you shouldn't mutate things, but eventually you have to mutate something. You have to have some kind of communication between threads. And I'm going to use a kind of standard example of this, which is, let's say you're writing a program that's uh, modeling a bank. And you're going to receive requests to transfer money between different accounts. And this is a pretty standard example of you know, the horrors of data races in normal programming. So I've written this request, this uh, program that's going to take a request, and it's going to find the, f the account that money is coming from, the account the, the, that the money is going to, and the amount of money I want to transfer. And then I'm just going to update it in place, which looks pretty straightforward. Account set, so now request.from, I've subtracted two and I've added, which looks fine. But imagine that two concurrent requests come in, and this little dance happens. Thread one hears that Alice is supposed to give $25, and thread two hears that Alice is supposed to receive $25. They both at the same time look up that Alice currently has $50. Thread 1 is now going to subtract 25, thread 2 is going to add 25, and now at the end of the day, you're going to end up with Alice having either $25 or $75 in her account, instead of what she should have, which is $50. And clearly, if you're running a bank, this is a really bad way to run a bank. And it's better if you're stealing people's money, I guess, if you're the bank, but you know, giving it away isn't something they like to do. So the normal way to solve this problem is with locking. You make sure that no two things are, are muta mutating the same thing, at the same time. So this is pretty simple. I'm going to lock the from account, I'm going to lock the to account, and then when I'm done, I'm going to unlock them. And that looks pretty nice. Problem is deadlocking. If you do this in the wrong way, 
you have the possibility of these two threads clashing with each other. Thread one locks Alice and then tries to lock Bob, while thread two locks Bob and then tries to lock Alice. Both of them are blocked indefinitely. And this is a very common problem that you have to deal with when you're dealing with concurrent algorithms. There are approaches to dealing with this. I'm not saying it's impossible. You can go ahead and you can put numeric IDs on all the accounts. And you can make sure that you sort them and then lock in the correct order. But this is painful and it's difficult to prove that your program is correct. This is the implementation that I would recommend doing in Haskell. We're going to use something here called software transactional memory. And if you look at the way that I've implemented this, I've done this a little bit longer than the real way. You'll see the real way later. But if you look at the way that I've implemented this here, I'm reading the variable, and then I'm writing the new value. It looks like we should have the exact same data race that I was telling you about before. It seems like two threads could easily read at the same time and then write conflicting values back to the variable. But there's a little word, well, actually, it's a big word. There's a word right at the top of the, that code block called atomically. And atomically makes everything different. Atomically says that within this transaction, everything is going to happen at the same time. These variables are called TVARs. They're transactional variables. And when we try to do atomically, it's going to check if any other thread has mutated these variables while we weren't looking. And if that's the case, it's simply going to retry this transaction and start over. This bypasses the need to do any kind of explicit locking. Behind the scenes, STM will do a little bit of locking if necessary, but we don't need to explicitly do locking, and we don't need to think nearly as much about race conditions. It's still possible to get a deadlock. It's still possible to have a race condition. But the likelihood of it happening in an STM-based implementation is significantly smaller. Uh, TVARs here, by the way, are also one of those examples where I told you about ex being explicit about the kind of mutability you have. An IO ref is something we saw a little bit earlier. So IO refs don't have any of these kinds of guarantees. TVARs do give you some of these guarantees. And MVARs are another example, mutex variables, which allow you to uh, do other things with IO. All right, so Bitcoin is, uh, is big these days. Let's say that I'm going to write a program that's going to buy me some Bitcoin. And I just told you that this whole thing retries. So I'm going to start my atomic, I'm going to start my STM block. I'm going to buy some Bitcoin. And then I'm going to increment the number of Bitcoins I have. And let's say that I have this going on in 20 different threads, because I got to buy a lot of Bitcoin. Well, I spent $100,000 buying the first three Bitcoins, or whatever it's up to these days. Let's say that one of the other threads did an update at the same time. Now, that thread, now my first thread is going to restart and it's going to try to buy three Bitcoins again. Pretty soon, I'm going to be about $100 million into debt because this thing screwed me over by retrying those actions multiple times. That's clearly not something good. So this retry logic can bite you, except that it can't. Because this whole thing is a trick question, the code above doesn't compile. And this is where purity comes back in and saves the day. If we didn't have purity in Haskell, you would have to be worried about this. But because of the purity in Haskell, we're able to ensure that the only effects that go on inside one of these blocks affect TVARs. They're not going to affect my bank account. They're not going to affect file system files. They're not going to fire the missiles, to use a common example from the literature. None of those things are going to happen. The compiler will prevent it. You, doing STM in another language is possible, but you have to be very careful that you're not going to accidentally slip in some other kinds of effects that should not be repeated. So STM, I think, is one of the killer features to consider in Haskell and has very few, down, as much as there's three disadvantages, there aren't really that many downsides to using STM. Once you're using STM, concurrent accesses to data, much, much easier. And you basically stop thinking about race conditions and deadlocks in nearly the same way you do other, in other places. If you don't have purity, STM is dangerous. But given that Haskell, you've already bit the bullet, you're already using Haskell, you've already put up with purity, you get this one for free. So you should just go ahead and use it. All right. And this is the fun one, laziness. Uh, it was very cheeky of me to wait this far into a talk on what makes Haskell unique to uh, bring up laziness, because laziness is probably the most unique thing to Haskell. I want to bring up this example that I showed you before. This, uh, this bit of code, if you look at it, is going to add up the numbers from one to a million. There are two problems with this code. The first problem is that there's a major performance bug in it. 
which is not at all immediately obvious. And the second is that the code just sucks. No one would want to write this code if they didn't have to. Fortunately, the second problem is going to solve the first problem, but I want to point out the first problem before we get to that. If I have this bit of code that says foo equals 1 plus 2, you would probably think that foo is equal to 3, if you're good at math at least. So you think that foo equals 3, but the answer is it doesn't. In the Haskell runtime, foo is currently an instruction to add 1 and, three, one and 2 together to get 3 when that value is needed. This is called a thunk. And a thunk means I'm going to have these instructions, and then I will evaluate the instructions when I need to. You can imagine that storing the instructions to add 1 and 3 is a lot more memory intensive than just storing the number 3. So this is just overhead seemingly for no reason. So we've got to have some reason why we'd want to do this. If you look at our loop, i is getting used as a number throughout this loop. It's constantly being compared against the number 1 million. This is what we call in Haskell being forced. And therefore, this isn't a thunk anymore. This is an actual machine int. But total is never used. The value is just built up. And what you end up getting in Haskell is a big tree of values, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, and so on down to a million. This takes a large amount of memory. Computing, it takes a large amount of CPU. It puts pressure on the GC. This is bad. And this is a major performance bug, and it's something you have to deal with. The easiest way to deal with it is what we call is with uh, bang patterns. Bang patterns are where you put an exclamation point and you put it in front of total. And this says to the Haskell runtime, make sure that you turn this into an int before you continue looping. And this solves the problem completely, but it's obviously an overhead when you're thinking about Haskell that you need to even deal with this kind of thing. So this is definitely in the downside column. Hopefully, though, there's some kind of a benefit that we're getting out of it in exchange. Going back to an imperative implementation, this is the way that it would look in a normal imperative language to add up the numbers one to a million. If we wanted to just do the evens, we can do that pretty easily by putting an if statement in the middle and checking if the number is even. And if we want to do something really silly, like only add up the number, we want to add up the numbers, but modulus 13 before we do it, we could do something like that too. But as, as you notice, this function is starting to get more and more convoluted. It's not difficult, per se, to do this. But if we were doing something more complicated, like, you know, for example, doing a look-ahead parser on the rest of the, the values, these things are starting to look pretty silly. Let's go back to Haskell. I said that this is a crappy implementation. No one wants to write it. No one wants, no one wants to have to think about the laziness. I kind of like the second implementation. That one's kind of nice. The problem is that this is going to take up 8 megabytes in memory, because you have a list of size 1 million. Fortunately, it doesn't, and that's where laziness comes in, because you never actually have a list of 1 million elements. Instead, you have a thunk. You have an instruction on how to create a list of 1 million elements. And you're able to lazily consume that and never put the whole thing into memory at once. This works with function composition, too. I can now stick filter and take only the even values. And once again, it's never going to create this other list. If you were dealing with a normal strict language, you would now have two lists being created, the original list and the evens only list. And we can add a map on top of that, and it still works. All of this is going to run in constant space. The point is that, function, that functional programming, together with, lazy, uh, with uh, a lazy programming language, makes for nice declarative high-level uh, programming without too much work. Another nice advantage, and I'm going to skip this one a little bit, we get short-circuiting for free. It's a feature that most languages have. Haskell has it for free. Short-circuiting with and and or isn't something that you normally, uh, that's something usually a special case in the language. In Haskell, it's just a normal operator. And the other downsides of laziness are that it means that there are exceptions that can be hiding behind your code. So the head function on an empty list can throw an exception. This is bad practice. We don't like partial functions. But there are still plenty of partial functions and uh, improperly lazy functions, like the lazy left fold, that exists. So that's a library problem that can be addressed, but it does exist right now. So laziness, more of a mixed bag than anything else that I mentioned to you. You get much more composable code. You get efficient results with high-level code. And you get the short-circuiting for free. But you do have to worry about space leaks. You have to deal with exceptions popping up all over the place. And bad functions, historically bad functions, are still uh, running around.
I think we're going to, so there are some other things you can look, I'll send you ever on the slides, I'll put them, make them available later, uh, but we're going to skip over the last uh, few of these and we're going to uh, skip straight to questions. Thank you, Michael. Sure. Uh, any questions? Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for a very interesting and full of well, many uh, data uh, talk. And uh, I was recently talking to a guy who was doing Haskell for some time, and then he has switched to Go language. And uh, he uh, has argued that uh, when you have such a simple language, and you have those uh, concurrency features and communicating with threads and avoiding the deadlock, etc., by channels, etc. Yeah. And uh, his argument was that uh, Haskell is too complicated uh, for doing uh, a job a similar which, uh, to which can be done in Go. And uh, my question is, uh, what would you advise, what would be your uh, persuasion for a company or for a person who uh, is working with some simple language that has some standard library or features that uh, help to deal with concurrency, but uh, you want to convince him to move to Haskell? It's a great question. And I don't disagree with what he's claiming. I do think this is actually one of the trade-offs that I didn't get to. Haskell is a complicated language. The libraries are complicated. There's a lot going on. So my first answer would be, don't use the whole language. There's no reason to do that. If you're working on a team, you shouldn't let people run free and download all 1,000 you know, popular packages on Hackage and start using all of those. That's not the approach you should take. Define a subset of the language. Define a set of libraries that you're allowed to use. Define some best practices. Go based on that. So assuming that you're able to do that, how would I compare that against Go? Because Go is that little subset out of the box. My answer would be that the differences between what you're getting out of Go and what you're getting out of Haskell are big. I don't believe that a language that allows uh, side effects throughout can give the same guarantees of Haskell when it comes to uh, data races and deadlocks. Sure, Go does give you lots of uh, concurrency primitives. It's not giving you STM. Uh, it's not going to give you the easy ability to compose functions together the way that you can do it in Haskell. So there are lots of advantages that you're getting. The question is, can you find a simple enough set of Haskell features that give you most of those benefits uh, and is still nicer than Go? I think you can, and I think a lot of companies out there are doing it that way, and I, I can give advice on where I think that, that line is. Uh, overall, that's what I would tell, say to them. Thanks. Sure. Hi. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm, I have a maybe silly question. Uh, I'm a Java product developer, and uh, sometimes I write in Python. <clears throat> so the first thing I think of when I look at the code, I think, hmm, how to debug this shit? <laughs> uh, and I thinking about the, all this fancy sugar you just shown us about concurrencies. Yeah. And I think just how to debug these things. I'm not well, close to Haskell, so maybe it's a silly question. Well, I, I, no, it's not a silly question at all. Debugging is, is a pain in any language. Uh, specifically, the concurrency parts I don't find to be the thing that's harder to debug in Haskell. Uh, there, are, there are some things that are harder to, to debug in Haskell. A space leak, as an example, is something which is harder to do, and it doesn't exist anywhere else, so it's, it's got to be harder in Haskell. Uh, the concurrency issues, you can use many of the same techniques that you would use elsewhere. There is a debugger. You can use printf debugging. Printf debugging works everywhere. Uh, most, of the, most of the techniques that you would use elsewhere, I find translate very naturally into Haskell. Uh, the nice thing about how, now, there's a, there's a meme out there. There's a stupid idea out there. If the Haskell code compiles, then it works. It's bullshit. Don't believe that. That's not the way it works. You do need to write tests. You do need to do debugging. What you can say about Haskell, though, is that there's a larger number of bugs that can't exist. Not that all bugs can't exist, but there's a, a, a bunch of bugs that can't exist. So for example, if you use concurrently and you use immutable data structures, you've just knocked off you know, five or six of the, the biggest bugs that you could be dealing with right off the bat. Does that mean that you couldn't have a logic error? No, you could definitely have a logic error going on in there. You could still have a deadlock if you do things incorrectly. But at least the biggest things that you could be hitting, you're not going to hit as much. Beyond that, I do this. I was never a good debugger person. I'm not a good tooling person. 
which is kind of funny because I work for a company that does tooling. Uh, I'm not a good person at using tooling, uh, so printf debugging is what I end up doing most of the time in all languages, not just Haskell. Okay, thank you. Sure. One last question, guys. First, thank you very much for your talk. Sure. Uh, I only found one thing that c could be easily done in imperative languages, and maybe I'm too stupid to figure out a solution in Haskell. Imagine a sorting function like QSort in C. Yep. It uses a callback to compare objects. Mm -hmm. Indeed, this callback could call a random number generator, but it also can write messages to a log. Yeah. What would be your solution for things like that, when you need a pure callback, but for debugging purposes or demo purposes, mm. it needs side effects. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So you can you can do it in an impure way. Uh, you could redefine your queue. You could have that queue sort function, and instead of taking a pure function to do the comparison, it could take an effectful function to do the comparison. Uh, and I could write out the code later if you want. Uh, you can do that kind of a thing, and then you can just in a very obvious way have the side effects. But if you're talking about debugging, there's a module in, uh, that comes with GHC called debug.trace. And you can just go ahead and it's cheating, it's completely cheating and you shouldn't use it in production, but we're talking about debugging. Everything goes with debugging, right? Uh, so while you're debugging, you can just go ahead and add these things called trace statements. And from pure code, you're able to spit some messages out to the console. Should you do this as a logging mechanism for your production web server? Please do not. You should do it properly, and I could tell you why it's a bad idea. It has to do with laziness, because laziness affects everything. Uh, but if all you're trying to do is get a little bit more information while you're debugging your program, it works just fine. Debug.trace is probably the way you want to go. Sure. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Sure.